you either live by the gun or you die by the sword. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And this week I have brought something for you. I want you to inhale, but do not... No, smell, but do not inhale. I can't smell it. That is because what you smelled is Iocane powder. (laughs) (laughs) Scentless, tasteless, and dissolves instantly in hot tea. (laughs) You brought stevia, didn't you? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So if you haven't guessed by now, we're talking about The Princess Bride. (laughs) Only the greatest movie to ever be concocted in my mind. Uh, This is hands down my favorite movie. It has been for as long as I can remember. Which is saying something because, as we've mentioned, the amount of Harry Potter memorabilia on my person at any time is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Princess Bride trumps that. I haven't seen any of your Princess Bride memorabilia. That's because I don't have a whole lot of true memorabilia. Because, I mean, merch wasn't really a thing for Princess Bride. Like, original merch. However, my mom knows that I love it so much that she embroidered phrases to it on our bed covers as a wedding gift. So I have pillows with it embroidered on along with your mailage magnet i do and then i have several hand-painted signs <laughs> i think i only got a deck of playing cards with characters <laughs> on it and i think that's all my merch i have from this movie and for me i i, I really like this movie but i'm one of those people who didn't see it until they were an adult so like it didn't i don't have the nostalgia goggles that a lot of people have for this movie i mean yes. i still love it but it's not the same kind of romantic love for this movie that people tend to have. Well, and this movie is, and was always meant to be, a classic fairy tale. And it was meant to be introduced to children, but also be so loved by adults that, you know, the adults would go, oh, you haven't seen this movie? You should watch it. It's a good movie. And then also tell their kids about it, who would then grow up to tell their kids about it. Mm-hmm. It's It's meant to do that. Yeah, and I I completely agree with that. I mean, that's how the movie starts off. It's with the grandfather explaining how the story came about that he was, that it was given to, told to him by his father and his father before him. He told it to his father and now he's telling it to you, which I think kind of speaks for the, the decade it came out because that was a lot of both parents were working and so it was up to the grandparents to, take over and there there's kind of like that jump in generations yeah definitely and also the actor who was picked to be the grandfather uh his other roles were considered when they were picking him they knew that the american public would overarchingly see the actor as kind of a grandfatherly figure someone they knew they connected with him it they weren't looking for that hidden face that no one knows they were looking for someone that you knew Hey, it's Granddad. Nice, sweet man. Gonna read me a bedtime story. Good times. Yeah, no, and I, I, I completely agree. He's he was perfect for the role. They actually put him in makeup to make him look older. Yeah, and they said it was the worst thing they'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, he just Reverse, appeared as himself, yeah, <laughs> which I think worked really well. You know, you definitely got a little bit of a location with a little bit of the accent. He kind of got a New York thing going on, but also not so much that it alienated anyone in the audience. It could have been any kid's bedroom. Mm -hmm. And even though some aspects of that bedroom haven't aged in such a way that like kids nowadays would recognize, it's still a kid's bedroom in such a way. Like it's not an inauthentically kid's bedroom, kind of like how some movies are where you're like that. No child lives like this yeah his bedroom is a very much a kid's bedroom so it already puts you in a spot where you instantly can put yourself in the kid's shoes and we all have memories of when we were sick what we did like during that time frame like i remember when i was a kid i wasn't allowed to play video games or and or do anything remotely (laughs) fun being sick i had to if i was having fun i was well enough to go to school (laughs) Good. I mean, and yeah, the video game is, it's not how video games are nowadays, but also it is very nostalgic. Even if you didn't actually get to play video games mm-hmm. as a sick kid, you you totally fell for it. You fell for this kid. Yeah. Um, I do think it's interesting, though, that 
they started the movie this way because the book doesn't start this way. So, and I'm not very familiar with the book. The only portions of the book I heard was the uh, director narrating over the story or over the film the okay. differences. So, the book is a very funny book in the fact that it's the book only exists in a parody format. Mm-hmm. So, it is a abridged book of no like there's no book that he abridged. The abridged is the final copy. Uh but he's pretending in his world that there is a book and that it's kind of based on history and some of the things in the book are based on history so it's a historically correct but not historically correct parody of a book that's abridged that doesn't yeah. exist and it was his way of uh skipping around the boring parts it was which i thought was really clever because also the boring parts of a book are usually what get cut in a movie mm-hmm. and so the fact that those sections are missing you don't really you don't miss them like i love the book the book's great I don't think the movie's missing anything by cutting those bits out. Example being the little boy. In the book, the little boy isn't this other little kid being told the story by his grandfather. It's the author being told by his own father. Yes. And the fact that that's not how it is makes more sense in a movie setting, because there's the director isn't going to be the small child. That wouldn't make any sense. And having the book author be the small child, again, wouldn't make any sense. So having this other kid show up, makes perfect sense works out well yeah no and it adds like it adds kind of another level to it because even if you weren't sick if you read stories as a child it's oh yeah it's a similar kind of thing like you remember the exciting parts you fell asleep during the boring parts exactly. and so it's that kind of rhythm where you're just constantly going and it's even though time's progressing through the day, he's eating a sandwich. It's yeah, they do. A, they do a good job with making you feel like this is an actual story, and not how some movies do it, where wow, you read a whole book in twenty minutes. That's mm-hmm. like incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but going on the book, so the book was written before the movie, but not a crazy ton before the movie. But enough at the same time where it, there was like a generation in between who grew up loving the book. They did. And apparently they had tried to make this movie several times and it never worked out for yeah. various reasons. The first time it got greenlit and then the executive who greenlits movies got fired. Mm-hmm. And so the author actually went back and bought the rights to the book. and With had, his own money. With his own money. And I think as he put it, <laughs> uh, some fuckwit couldn't mess it up. <laughs> because then, th- this is like one of two books... That he likes that he wrote because he doesn't like any of his other work. Yeah, and like by the time he had bought it back, like it wasn't just that one time that they had tried to make it. That time had failed. A different time had failed for um, just getting it greenlit in the first place. A different time had failed because because well that that's the thing is they they they, weren't they knew it was a good book they They just just weren't sure if it was movie quality book. Well, and it sounded like a lot of the times when they were trying to make it, they were hoping to hit that big summer blockbuster. And this story isn't a blockbuster movie. No. It's the it's a good movie. It's a great movie. But it's not line up around the city block to see it in theaters sort of no. movie. This movie's definitely an at-home with your own home popcorn and snack of choice. Maybe even dinner with a movie tray, because that's how special you are as a child. And that's that's kind of the special thing that makes this movie so great, is that it was something people picked up. Like, it, yes. it was passed by word of mouth, rather than like, oh, you have to go see this movie, it wins an award, or it wins multiple awards, Yeah, and then you forget about it. This movie nope. is so beloved, and I think that's part of it is because people rented it. The, there was yes. that whole, there was the whole ritual of going to a movie store, renting a movie, taking it home, heat, heating up your pizza or whatever you yep. were having Got for dinner. Pizza rolls. Pausing it ten minutes in to go heat up the popcorn. Yes, well, and I think this movie, while it wasn't a horrible flop when it did hit theaters. It wasn't the booming success they had originally hoped for, even by understanding they weren't going to be making a blockbuster. But then it hit VHS tapes, and Mm -hmm. sales went through the roof for VHS tapes. I think you can still say that, like, it's still making money, because we both own various different copies of, like, I think all five of our friends own this movie. None of us own the same variation on it. No. You have a cool book version. Yes. I've got the collector's version for when it re-came out Mm -hmm. uh, for the anniversary. 
I think Crystal has the original like box cover art for it. If she has it, if she has box cover for it at all, I'm surprised she none be. of us own the VHS. Honestly, I don't know why I don't own the VHS tape because I definitely watched this movie a ton growing up. But I also think I watched it on TV a lot. And see, I never had that experience. Like there, there's a lot of these movies from this era that are like loved by people that I didn't get around to seeing because well, it wasn't brought to me. Because yeah, I, I mean, I didn't see the Goonies until I was around uh, the same time I watched The Princess Bride. Goonies is a good one. Same with Labyrinth, Dark Crystal. Yeah. Like, all these like classic staple childhood movies of our generation. I didn't experience until I was in my mid twenties. Well, and you also missed out on the culture and we're gonna go over this once Christmas hits, because that's that's my movie picking opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's an entire like like generation of of people, myself included where we didn't really have cable. If we had it, we had it kind of later in our childhood. We mostly had just, you know, your free TV stations. And so you watched the movies that they picked to put on the TV. So we watched the same movies every year because they had the rights to play that. So that's why the Peanuts are so well loved. We watched them every single year for every holiday. And that, I mean, I had a very similar upbringing, but in a different way where like I had AFN and before 9-11 we had seven channels i think one was sports <laughs> one was news one was family uh i think the others were like spillover channels i think four of the seven were actually like watchable <laughs> or they yeah. had two family channels so like i grew up on oldie shows like my first batman is adam west and yeah. so he'll always hold that spot in my heart because he's that was the first Batman I knew. So, I, you know, I can I, I understand where the, it's coming from, where, like, this movie was so well-loved and how it became a cult classic. Definitely. Well, and the other thing about this movie that it hit that a lot of the other cult classics didn't manage to get was it doesn't, it doesn't hit that weird point at any moment in the movie. Dark Crystal is a good example. Dark Crystal is definitely a great movie. Mm -hmm. It's become a huge cult classic. But it hits that uncanny valley pretty quick. Which I know what that is now. All right, you Googled it. Did <laughs> you Googled find it. the teddy bear with teeth? I've seen teddy bear with teeth before. That is the epitome of uncanny valley to me. <laughs> oh, I don't like it. But but even though it is a cult classic, it it's not a thing for everyone because mm -hmm. it does hit that point pretty quick. And a lot of cult classics do that. Yeah. That's why they're cult classics and they weren't big when they originally came out. Princess Bride doesn't do that. Princess Bride, I think, could advertise itself as a little something for everybody. Yeah, no. And be completely honest in that statement. And that's the thing, though, too, is it it is very much so not just a kid's movie. It has... It has a, enough adult, like, line... Not, mm -hmm. Nothing's raunchy, nothing's, like, bad language, but it's clever in yeah. a way that an adult would get. I mean... Like, pretty much every line Billy Crystal says in this movie, is targeted to the adult audience because he says it so quick and he's playing on words that kids aren't going to... They're not going to grab. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, a good example is, um, you should leave, I'm going to call the Brute Squad. Andre says, I I'm on the Brute Squad. He goes, oh, you are the Brute Squad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, kids aren't going to catch that, but well, an adult would. And that's the thing about this movie, too. Like, for it being... And, and that there's, there's this, like, series of movies that I'm surprised have done so well in the U.S., because of how dry they are, specifically anything Mel Brooks has done. Yes. Monty Python. Monty Python's a great example of like, wow, this is very classical British humor, mm -hmm. and yet it's huge here. People love it. Yeah. And Princess Bride hits that exact same level. It does. Level. And I think part of the reason, though, that Princess Bride, um, its humor does work is because it wasn't an American film trying to be a British film. It just naturally was a british style film yeah they filmed i think in mostly mostly uh, in england mostly yeah. in england a little bit in like maybe ireland i think just a little bit um but and then there was a couple sets in california and yeah. that was it but most of it was england and then at no point did they ever require the entire cast to put on an accent that they couldn't perform no which i'm surprised like because i i mean i'd seen the movie a couple times before but going back like uh, Robin Wright, the yes. chick who plays Buttercup. That's her actual accent. But she's not British. She's no. from America. Her dad's English. Yeah. And so, like, she... I, I didn't realize, like, 
because one, I didn't realize who she is, and like I've seen her in so much since then. Exactly. As a mature woman, like she yeah. she was really young in that movie. She was, and she I think I think she herself in one of the interviews I was watching mentioned that she almost didn't get the part because she was one of the last people that they uh, had performed to try out for this. And they were so enamored with her accent and the way that she held herself and the way she kind of glid aclo- or glided across the stage. Uh, they were like, oh, we finally found it. A classic princess. Mm-hmm. Which, how lucky is that to be the princess? Yeah. No. And I mean, th- that that's one thing that's interesting about this movie is that it's not like your knight in shining armor coming to save you either. Like, No. They, they do a... It's a fantastic job of just setting it up because you skip really through their romance. You don't, you don't see their romance. Like really it's not don't. really a part of the film. Well, and part of that is directly from the book, which I think is part of the brilliance of it. Is because it's a fairy tale. We're not. Yeah, it's a romance. It's a romance film. Yes. It, again, it's got a little bit of everything, but the story isn't necessarily about the romance. The romance is the thing that keeps the plot moving. Mm-hmm. Which is different than a normal romance where the plot happens to the romance. Like, the romance happens because of the plot. Mm -hmm. In this one, the plot happens because of the romance. Yes. Which I think works really well because most kids, the reason they don't like romance movies is because they're kind of boring. They're a little bit too mushy. There's a lot of stuff going on that they don't care about. But a kid can understand, oh yeah, you love that person. Great. Now you're a pirate. Why not? (laughs) Yeah. Or like, because I think they mention in the book that she kind of suspects he's someone she remembers, but okay. the movie doesn't portray that very well. So I do have one slight issue with the book. And, okay. Um, so Buttercup in the book is not a very bright person. She's pretty dense. She spends several times... She she doesn't even realize she's in love with Wesley until a different character who's not in the movie comes and spends her whole day admiring how beautiful Wesley is. And then she is jealous, doesn't realize she's jealous, then spends the entire evening being like, why am I jealous? Am I jealous? I must be jealous. Why am I jealous? I must be in love. But at the same she's time... She's not bright. <laughs> yeah, at the same time, I mean, that's kind of like how it feels yeah. to be a young person in love. It's like, do I actually really love this person? Do I not? Wait, what am I feeling? Because Did I just have cheese for dinner? <laughs> Maybe. Because, <laughs> well, they're, they're what, teenagers in the book or something? I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I do want to. I do remember them saying that they were fairly young. The entire first part of the book, which I think is pure gold, goes through, like, the most beautiful women in the world. And it's not done like how an American pageant would be or anything like that. It's like a factual list. This person is the most beautiful person. Now this person is the most beautiful person. Now Buttercup is the mo- it's like a Pokemon stat. <laughs> You're just assigned it at birth, apparently. Like it's a whole. It's very funny. It's a very humorous look at a romance yeah. and at human beauty and attraction. Well, and that, that's... and I I think the movie kind of pulls it off without directly referencing. Yeah, that. and I I think that's kind of an interesting aspect because in my life I've been I've had this I've been in this weird point in my life where friends are getting married, people are having children. And, like, their children are at the age where, like, this movie could be shown to them. And Definitely. And I've been thinking, like, well, what has, like, these kind of movies done to just romance in general in yes. our culture? Because that that's the thing that I've never understood is, like, why someone, oh, I have to be the most beautiful person in this person's eyes. Do they find you beautiful? Everyone's yes. beautiful for different reasons, not, like, this is the the beautiful, this is the second beautiful, this is the third beautiful. I and- don't... And this movie and the book both do a good job of poking fun at that concept Mm -hmm. because it it does very, I remember explicitly state like in the world, this person is the most beautiful and like, but it does it in such a way where it's like, okay, sure. Example being when Buttercup becomes the most beautiful person in the world, I think she does it after she loses Wesley because she gets really depressed and spends all of her time, uh riding her horse, brushing her hair, washing her face, and not eating. So she loses weight, bothers to brush her hair, and bothers to take a bath. (laughs) And now she's the most beautiful person in the world. So it just, the whole book pokes fun at that idea. And then the movie, while never directly addressing that situation, 
does also poke fun at the entire concept of romance by putting in the little lines like, they had the most passionate kiss ever recorded in history. And like, how do you measure that? How do you prove that? You don't. It's a fairy tale. Yeah. But it's also expressing an emotion because for those two, that is... That is their truth. Their moment. Yeah. The other thing I really like about this movie uh, is the casting was spot on. Oh, yeah. No, I'm I'm honestly glad this movie wasn't produced until this yes. cast came together because it's... It is the perfect group. It is. I mean, you have some of the best talent, like Air- Andre the Giant. This was just him coming out of wrestling. and Yes. Well, and they they say that, like, this role was written for him. They always had him in mind, even from the very beginning. And the only other person that I think was considered, other than, like, the, the occasional, like, throw a name on the table doesn't stick, the only other person that they truly considered was Arnold Schwarzenegger. But by the time this movie was made, they couldn't afford Arnold. He was way too big. He was a big-ticket person by mm-hmm. then. And, and, so, even, and even then, Arnold's bulky. He's not... He's not a the giant. Gi- yeah, he's not Andre the Giant. Like, yeah. there's, there, there's something to be said about, like, just waiting for that specific time. Everything yes. falls together for a reason. It, it really does. And then also, um, they got incredibly lucky with picking the actor to play Wesley. Um, they, they, That was, I think, the hardest piece to put together for them. Because how do you find someone who is both swashbuckling, handsome, confident, but also maybe a pirate, but also kind of got this Zorro thing. Farm boy, peasant. Farm boy, pe- like, he has to be all of it, mm-hmm. but also be able to learn fencing, wrestling, which put on a great accent, be confident the entire movie. Which That's hard. I mean, he and uh, in a, the guy who played Inigo Montoya, they... They didn't have so they they studied fencing and yes. they just practice all the time and that's why their fencing is so good because they had that dedication to it. Yeah. Um. Th- so you're right. They did do a bunch of um practicing for the sword fighting because they knew they weren't going to have any stunt doubles put in for them during that scene. The only stunt double is there's a somersault portion and any gymnastics is someone else. It is which isn't very much of that fight scene. No. Uh, the gentlemen who helped train them are the same two guys who are uh, responsible for the swordsmanship in Star Wars. And, I mean, they clearly did their research. I'm no sword fighting expert, but I did watch several people's critiques on it. And by a movie standard, it sounded like they did a really good job. From just a casual watcher standpoint, it's incredibly believable. It's witty. It moves the plot along. It's entertaining to watch. I think the only other sword fighting that I have seen that I liked as much as this one, but on a, but for a completely different reason, was the original Pirates of the Caribbean. When that first came out and the sword fighting was done to the music, mm-hmm. I think that's the only other time that I've had this experience of, wow, sword fighting looks really fucking cool. Oh, yeah. No, and just... That, that's, the, that's the interesting thing about this movie, is we have such high-class talent, really and at do. the time, developing talent. Yes. But then we also have kind of the lower-end special effects. Oh, and yeah. The movie's the movie's <laughs> kind of this in-between of... Really, really high quality. And, and then, campy. Yes. Like, and I think it balances out really well to kind of continue that storybook feel that you get from children's novels. Where, like, one page of art will be mind-blowingly amazing, the story makes sense, and that little piece of poetry works so well, and then the next page is a dog's butt. Mm-hmm. And that's just how kids' stories are, and that's how this movie runs, but it works. Um, I also think part of the reason this movie worked is because of its quotability. Oh, yeah. This movie oh, is yeah. incredibly quotable. And... Part of the reason is because kids like quotable movies. That is that is a fact. If you want to make a kid's movie, make it quotable. Shrek is a good example of that. <laughs> is the movie Shrek good? Yes. Yes, it is. The yes, first one. <laughs> the first one is good. And then they kept making it because kids wouldn't <sighs> stop repeating the movie Shrek. I was one of those children. I'm so sorry, Mom and Dad. <sighs> yeah. I mean, I still repeat Shrek every now and then. I but... could probably still quote that whole movie. Well. But... 
that's part but the quotes from this movie aren't i wouldn't say like shrek because the shrek quotes while hilarious to a kid and still hilarious to me but again coming from a kid's mindset the quotes from princess bride work on an adult conversation level Mm -hmm. the amount of times apparently inconceivable was yelled to the actors was getting to like an obnoxious level (laughs) Oh, I I don't doubt it. I mean, that that is probably besides like marriage, marriage. or my name is Inigo Montoya. Yeah, you kill my father. And just to have a one word quotable thing, that's pretty. That's gold. Yeah. Um. Well, quick little tangent. Speaking of Shrek. Oh yeah. Guess uh g- guess who I thought of in this movie. I have no idea. When Prince Humperdinck comes out to announce that he's <laughs> getting married. <laughs> Makes me think of Lord Farquaad. Even yeah. the castle, the courtyard. The whole thing. And you know which, what? That's a legitimate castle, it too. Is. Well, because I remember someone from the cast during one of these interviews saying, uh, well, we have to go to England. There's no castles here for us to <laughs> film at. <laughs> which I, I love that mindset as opposed to being like, and like the castle, while gorgeous, if it had, if you told me it was on set, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Yeah. No problem. But the fact that it's a real castle and it's so tiny, like, I love it. Well, but also, like... But that's the thing, is we... In want, America, we think of castles as huge, but they're not. No, they're, Most they're the not. Most of the time, they're not. Most, I've been to one large castle, and it was cool. They There's... Uh, I can't remember which castle it was, unfortunately. But there's a whole... There's, like, this big chunk of a dent in, a, in one of the walls, <laughs> because they're cannon fired at the wrong angle they shot their <laughs> own wall <laughs> but yes. that's the structure of that wall is that like it could take a hit from their own yeah and it was a massive cannon well and by castle standards i suppose from from what i from what i know and from going and visiting castles in europe uh this isn't a small castle this is pretty big it's got inside rooms it's got a tower it's got a courtyard the whole nine yards whereas a lot of the ones that i got to see and go into we're literally just a tower, and they'd be like, welcome to our castle. And you're like, where? Is, mm-hmm. Did it fall down? They're like, no, this is it. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, okay. I mean, it's still cool, but it's not what I thought. Yeah. I mean, this one does a pretty good job of living up to that castle expectation. Uh, I also appreciate that while we do see the courtyard and the, you know, the tower in which we present Humperdinck, but not the princess for reasons I still don't. I don't, does she not fit up there with everybody else? Is it? She's being protected by a dragon. I don't know. (laughs) Like, I feel like, hey, peasants who haven't met my new wife and may be hostile to me, which is why I'm up here. My wife's down there. If you accidentally stab her, oh no. Which, I, that, his arc is an interesting one because. It is. We're not, he's not really shown as a bad guy to begin with. He's. He's just the prince. But we do see him as an opposition to begin with because, one. She doesn't love him. No. She loves... She loves Wesley. Yeah. And so... Good name recognition. This is probably one of That's the only movies this you know only, This is it. Only movie you know names. <laughs> this is it. There's a limited number of casts. She also yells Wesley quite a lot in this movie, which did help with the impression. <laughs> but... Um, but, like, back, back to, like, his arc. Like, he's he's not seen as a bad guy until we're caught up with... Until we catch up with Wesley and... The yes. protagonist and antagonist meet. Up until then, he's just as far as we know, he's a prince trying to get his princess back, regardless of whether she loves him or not. And you know, for the time period, as like as a kid, you're like, "Well, he's that's silly," but as an adult, you're like, "Well, that's how kingdoms are run." Okay, I guess. I learned up until the up until uh, recently, the early 20th century, you could auction your wife off. Oh, good. That sounds totally safe and normal. It was more of a way to get out of divorce. Ah, yeah, that horrible, very non-Catholic thing. Yes. Can't have any of that ancient Catholic disobedience. <laughs> but one of the things that I appreciate about Humperdinck in the movie is I despised Humperdinck in the book. He's mm-hmm. He is both very similar and not all at the same time. So Humperdinck in the movie is a very fit man. He's shown to be, you know, middle-aged gentleman. He is decent at ruling his country, apparently. We don't, we're never told otherwise that he's not. I mean, he has a fleet of ships and he seems to be doing fine. He has a zoo specifically meant for him to kill and eat. 
Well, okay. So in the book, they explain the zoo. So in the book, he's not fit. He's described as kind of roly poly and <laughs> not and not that good looking. <laughs> and he's obsessed with hunting to the point where it is causing problems with the kingdom. Like he's always gone to Africa to shoot lions, sort of hmm. like problem. So the whole background of the zoo slash pit of despair in the movie is well. He has to be forced to stay in the kingdom to run the gosh darn kingdom. So they build this zoo of horrors or whatever they call it. I don't remember. Zoo of something. Uh, And it has five levels. Specifically so he can hunt things whenever he feels like it. Mm -hmm. Without having to leave the country. And each level is something different. Like there's a poison level. There's a fear level for like arachnids and bats. And there's just a bunch of like absolutely ridiculous things kept in this zoo for him to hunt like gorillas and shit level one wild boars he has to kill a hundred of them to make a level maybe (laughs) all i remember is that the last level level five was specifically left empty so that he could fill it with whatever was worthy of his opponent Mm -hmm. which you know would be a person because that's because man is the dangerous game because well you know what was that serial killer who uh, hunted people like they were deer is like oh, that. He had a pretty good quote about it. I don't remember anymore though. I know who you're talking about. Oh, uh, side tangent as well. Mm. Uh, apparently this month the toy box killer's uh, wife got let go. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, I feel so safe. <sighs> okay. <Good. laughs> side little tangent. <laughs> I mean, she belongs in the zoo as well, I uh, guess. But so. Oh, oh, can you imagine that? A zoo of serial killers? Just... Oh, no. Oh, it'd either be really bad or really, like, really well put together. But there's no other It'd be like Death Race or whatever that <laughs> island movie was. Uh, would it be like Dead Man Wonderland? I don't know. That mm. show was weird. But, yeah. But anyway, so level five was supposed <laughs> to have been for man. And in the movie, we, we switch it over to now that's the pit of despair. And... But... I liked Humperdinck in the movie better. Yeah. Like, he makes more sense to me as just kind of this eccentric guy who's the best. In the- like, if we're going to call everyone the most beautiful, the best kiss, why not have the best hunter in the world also just be the, I don't know, the Prince King? Yeah. Uh, My favorite character by far in this movie, though, is the actual king, the old man who's, like, losing his <laughs> mind. <laughs> I love that person. That character is by far my best, like, the best thing in this movie for me. He cracks me up. She kissed me. She kissed me. That's <laughs> nice, dear. Like, he's so cute. He is adorable. He's an adorable old man who only has, like, five lines in this whole movie. And he still wormed his way into my heart. Mm-hmm. Well, that's one thing. Um, I was reading one of the uh, uh, reviews of the film. And... The guy was talking about how his, uh, his, his, uh, he, he got his niece to help him out by watching the movie with him just to get like a fresh perspective. And he was talking about that, like rewatching it, that Wesley and Buttercup don't really feel like the main characters. It's no. more, um, uh, I can't remember. Fezzik? Andre's the giant Fezzik, Fezzik and uh, In- Inigo Montoya. Yeah, definitely. They definitely do feel like the main characters because while you do care a bit about Buttercup, for reasons unexplainable, you kind of care more about the side characters and their quest because you can, especially as an adult, I think you can very much uh, bond with both of their hardships that they've been going through Mm -hmm. their hardships feel much more real to you than wesley's hardships and buttercup's non-existent hardships like girls got it pretty good yeah so you feel for them a lot more and then to have an actual arc throughout the movie where you finally get a satisfying end to that Mm -hmm. it does make sense that they're a lot of people's favorites because in that point if we're looking at it that way Inigo Montoya is definitely the main character at that point. Definitely. And Fezzik is... His lovable side character. Yeah, because he doesn't really have too much of an arc. Like No, but I do think one of the reasons why Fezzik is people's favorite, and why a lot of people would still put him at the same level as Inigo character-wise, is because 
this is one of only two movies that Andre starred in. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had done some TV per, uh, appearances before. I think he was in Zorro wow. and like Hercules or stuff like that. No shit. He did wrestling. He was on TV. He was on TV. <laughs> uh, and they said that that was part of the reason why his acting was already up to par. But also he came at it from a completely different standpoint mm-hmm. than a standard actor. So when you're watching him on screen, it feels a lot less like an actor and much more of like a guy who's finally living out his dream. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing is like, even though these characters are over the top, we'll oh, say that. Very much so. They're still believable. They're not past that point where like. Yeah, they're 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 crazy. They're outlandish. But you know what? Why not? Mm-hmm. Why not spend 30 years of your life studying sword? sword play to kill a man with six fingers on one hand mm-hmm. how many six fingered guys can there be in the world and that's that's the thing is you kind of the, the way they do they built the characters up is so well done and that's that's part of the charm of it is yeah, that definitely you don't need this long overarching arc for every single character no their you backstories need... are like what two sentences on the boat do you want if to be re- unemployed in Greenland and a slobbering drunk? Like too drunk to buy brandy. There you go. Like <laughs> backstory done. <laughs> yeah. No. And same same with Buttercup and uh, Wesley. Yeah. They're farm mm-hmm. people. And in the book, like she has parents, and in the movie, they're just like, "Nah, she doesn't have parents. It's fine." <laughs> yeah. Why? We don't need to show the parents. We just assume she has parents. There's no need to elaborate on it when your imagination does just as good a job. Mm-hmm. No. And Interesting thing, though, about Andre in this movie. Mm-hmm. So this movie was shot right after he had had back surgery. So he couldn't do a lot of the no, heavy lifting. That... He could barely hold his own weight. Yeah. So like all of the scenes where. So there's not a ton of stunt doubles in this movie. There's there's not much need for them. Except for the fight scene between Fezzik. Or not Fezzik. Um, Inigo. Inigo. And Wesley. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, Fezzik, no, Fezzik and that's Wesley. what you're thinking about. Yeah. yeah, between Fezzik and Wesley. So all of the far away shots are a different person. And if you look closely, you can tell that the stunt double oh, is yeah. significantly smaller than Andre. Oh, yeah. And uh, print Buttercup rolling down the hill is a dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we... but that, that's about it. Because on top of that, um, the first day of shooting was the fire swamps. Yeah. And they lit her dress on fire. And I think she actually got burnt doing it too. I think like, so. And I think they had to take the take again because the first time it happened, the director was ups- like yelled out, her dress is on fire and they had to reshoot it. <laughs> <laughs> but on top of that, like there was some very clever like camera positioning so that people could be standing on platforms behind, uh, behind Andre or some clever wire work with mm-hmm. Buttercup jumping into his arms. And it kind of... Like especially like her jumping to his into his arms, it feels very fairy tale esque and almost a little goofy. But at the same time, it's not so blaringly obvious that that's what they're doing mm-hmm. that it distracts from the movie. And that's kind of a sad part too is that he he had so much back problem or so much problems that he couldn't even hold her. And I think she said she weighed like hundred and twelve pounds or something. Yeah, she was at the, her smallest. She said. Yeah, and he couldn't even do that. No. But apparently he loved this movie and was so proud of this movie. And the rumor is that he kept a copy after it came out uh, that he would carry everywhere with him (laughs) and make people watch it with him as much as physically possible. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I've already told you guys this. If I could be an extra in a movie, I would buy that movie and force you guys to watch (laughs) it so many times and just point out, look, there's me. But can you imagine that level of excitement and you're one of the main characters? Oh, yeah. Like, oh yeah. That's what level he was at. He you and you could tell throughout the whole movie that he's having a blast being in this movie. Oh, yeah. And you can tell they all are. Like they it, definitely are. They all wanted to do this. It wasn't like mm-hmm. they needed a paycheck or they were just no. trying to make it into film. They all wanted to be in this. And apparently wherever they would go, the director would rent a house and would cook dinner for the whole crew to come over. And everyone would say, you know, that really helped solidify us as a family. It's mm-hmm. part of the reason why when the anniversary rolled around for this movie, not only the fans, but they themselves were excited to have a reunion for this movie. Mm-hmm. It's just the same. Andre couldn't make it. it. Very much so. But Which, when, you, when you're that large, something is going to go wrong, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. And I learned there's a there was a dude who was like twice his size. Yes. Like... They don't have pictures because it was before people really took pictures. Yeah. But 
Well, and there's even a couple of people who we do have pictures of who are taller, but it was rare to get that combination of both being incredibly tall and also built out like a wrestler and mm-hmm. not just really tall. I think the cognac had something to do with it. As cognac and beer had something to do with it. Yeah, <laughs> I think the official cause of death was a heart problem, like was heart failure. Mm-hmm. But also, like how, like, what do you attribute heart failure to when you're over five hundred pounds and over seven feet tall? Oh yeah, like if that could be anything. It could have been the what twenty something beers he would drink on a regular basis. It could have been all the wrestling he did. Like and the this, world's best drunk. And you know. He he wrestled for an incredibly long period of time for how beat up he was getting. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fact that, you know, he didn't have... Like, it would have been a miracle if he never had anything wrong whatsoever. So, but it was it was a really good way also for a lot of us to be introduced to Andre as a person. Because even if you're not really into wrestling, Andre as a wrestler is incredibly fun and charming to watch. Mm-hmm. And it was definitely a good gateway into that for a lot of us. And I didn't really grow grow up on wrestling. The only stuff I've really seen um, was AFN showed Stone Cold Steve Austin era stuff. Yeah. But the only stuff I've seen of Andre the Giant is uh, the meme of him just shaking his head, shaking his hands. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no. And then also (laughs) I've seen the match where he was in Japan and they were just trying to beat him down. And he just took it. Yeah. Like... He was a rock. It was oh, amazing. Yeah. Um, one thing I do kind of want to go over is... There, there are certain parts that I actually found interesting watching this as an adult. And re-watching it is... Uh, we, we talk about these uh, characters and their fights against Wesley and the, the struggles they go through. Yeah. It's the people who challenge Wesley without respect or are disrespectful are the ones who don't make it. That's true. That's a good way to think of it, too. Which, if you even think about it, the Dread Pirate Roberts is where it starts. Yeah, which I really like the introduction of Dread Pirate Roberts as a character. I guess you call him a character. Because if you thought about it logically, the Dread Pirate Roberts could have and probably should be considered the villain of this movie. He's Mm -hmm. the one who kidnaps Wesley. He's the one who theoretically kills Wesley. But also, he's kind of the Obi-Wan figure. He is. And he's also not in either the book or the movie. He's just, like, for all we know, Wesley made all of that up. Yeah. And why not? He's still a poor farmer somewhere else. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, well, if if the Dread Pirate Roberts does exist, he has branding on point. (laughs) He really does. (laughs) He's got this figured out. I also like that they played off of just enough uh real life things that people go yeah that's the thing example being the iocane powder mm-hmm. iocane powder is not real it is no. not based off of anything real but the idea of you know building up an immunity to poison well everyone's heard of that there's there's always that one story going around of some guy who built up such an immunity because he was afraid to be poisoned that then when he finally wanted to die of poisoning he couldn't do it sort mm-hmm. of like that story is always around and so the fact that Iocane powder in this movie is completely fake, everyone knows it's fake. Yeah. But for a second, you think, well, maybe it's not fake. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe Iocane powder's real. And even then, like, the effects in the movie are pretty solid. Like, the rodents of unusual sizes. It's just campy enough where, like, I rewatching it, I forgot about the eels. And they're oh, like, the oh, it's the shrieking eels. And I'm like... Oh no! Not a lake eels. full of eels. These little things that you cut and put on your sushi, <laughs> and it's like, and then you see it. And it's like, oh, okay. I completely <laughs> forgot about well, you. Well, and in the book, they're not eels at all. They're sharks because they're in the ocean, and that's where that's where sharks go is in the ocean. Yeah. And the whole reason they come to attack is because one of the kidnappers throws like a big old cup of his own blood into the ocean but like Jeez. that's that's not quite on brand for the movie version no and so by switching it up to not only eels but shrieking eels and giant shrieking eels and what are shrieking eels attracted to splashing in the water in the giant lake ocean <laughs> why not <laughs> yeah but it also kind of reminded me a little bit of like the complete like um 
acceptance of the fake reality that um, the series of unfortunate events brought about. It, like none of those things work. None of like giant eels that are attracted to you splashing in the ocean lake shouldn't logically make sense, but you've agreed to suspend your disbelief. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why not? Why yeah. not giant eels? And yeah, they're kind of scary. And as a kid, I remember not really appreciate, like not liking the eels. They were kind of creepy. Yeah. I didn't like it. The rodents are creepy. The albino's creepy. The, the albino's creepy. I do appreciate the albino um, because the albino is a play on the albino in the book. Because the albino in the book does whisper everything he says. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this albino starts to whisper and then makes a joke about how, no, he's got a normal voice. He's yeah. just kind of a pasty dude with gross hair. And like the machine where it sucks years of your life. Yes. Like. It's... An experiment in pain. For what reason? We're never told. We're never like told any more of his study. No. But why not? You know, we've got an entire zoo of creatures over there in the left corner. Why not? Why not have a pain room? <laughs> I can't think. I can't help but think of Hellraiser. <laughs> no tears. It's such a waste of good suffering. <laughs> Which, I mean, Wesley really does hold on. Like, he's he, he's all, he acts stoic. And even when yeah. he's being tortured, he's screaming. But, and that's the other thing. Yes. His screams are so loud, the entire kingdom the hears entire them. The entire kingdom can hear his pain. And they don't even call it a normal scream, do they? They call it, like, the, the noise that a heart makes when it breaks. Or something yeah. dramatic like that. But it's, but, it, it all, it's all that layering it, of, like, the... Yes little things that add to the whole movie like definitely th this movie is I i'm this movie is gonna out probably outlive us honestly oh for sure like so, like definitely like there's movies that i remember from from our childhood that like to me feel like a classic but i can totally understand if like my kids or my grandkids mm -hmm. aren't aren't into it this one is not one of those like oh, yeah. every kid i've ever like when i was babysitting if i showed this movie they loved it. They always enjoyed it. They always, no matter who it was, it could be the boys who were into Star Wars and Transformers, or it could be the girls that I would watch who were super into princesses and ponies. Mm -hmm. Both groups loved this movie. Which is is kind of an interesting thing, because, like, you can still show this to adults. Like, I was, when I was in uh, Denver this week, and I was talking with my buddy Cameron on this, and he hadn't seen this movie until a couple of years ago as well, and... It still holds up. Yeah, no. There's I'm, not a lot of kid movies, even older kid movies, that actually hold up. And I think part of that is the practical effects again. Yeah, like, no. Like I, I, I know I keep harping back to this, but but there's something behind practical effects. Exactly. Yeah. Like definitely. The classic, classic Star Wars holds up to a point. I, I agree. There were some things yeah. that needed to be updated, but it's when you start inputting that even older CGI that still. Yeah. It still doesn't fit. Like, even nowadays, um, I saw a trailer yesterday um, for a new movie that Will Smith's going to be in where he's uh, fighting himself, but a younger self. Yes, I saw and the trailer And they CGI'd for his, a younger face on him. And yeah. it, it's... We're kind of at that point where it's like, yeah, we can do this, but it's... But why? Why, why should we do this when we could have had an actor who just looked like you younger? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I always appreciate appreciated the effort that would go into when casting had to do something like that where you can tell that they spent the time and effort getting the perfect person and this movie they got the perfect people even i even don't know like, why they didn't just use will smith because he doesn't age very much so well also doesn't he have like a son who's into acting too <laughs> mm. i guess <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll call it acting we'll, we'll say that <laughs> but like, even the side characters in this one, uh, like Miracle Max, who else could have possibly played not only Miracle Max, but Miracle Max's wife? Who I, Does Miracle Max's wife even have an actual name in the I think the she does. I feel like she does, and I'm just not recalling it. All I remember is him calling her, uh, you're calling her a witch. <laughs> I'm not a witch. <laughs> but, um, who else could have taken that, that side role... Is she just the wife of Miracle Max? <laughs> oh, her name is Valerie. 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 Uh, <laughs> now I'm seeing that makeup on your screen, and oh man. 
But that that's the thing, you know too, what? is, like, the make... It still, it works, because if you put her, and, like, yeah, you're, like, I'm looking at a picture of her in the costume and the makeup next to a picture of herself, but when you see her standing next to him in makeup in their dirty hut thing, <laughs> like, it looks fine. It looks like an old couple. A, yeah. a kind of gross old couple, but an old couple, a little eccentric. Oh, what did he say? I think the director, uh... Uh, commented on what he wanted the makeup to be like. I think it was a combination between his grandmother and someone else. And but I mean they well, and I just I remember uh, him talking about his role and how he was really pleased that he was pulling inspiration from people he actually knew and like that's how they actually talked when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so he was putting in a little Yiddish where he could. And... The same thing with the priest Mowage. Mm -hmm. Uh, they they mentioned that that was he had been to a wedding and that's how the that's how the priest the, spoke the, yeah. <laughs> and like I I think I read somewhere that Billy Crystal and Carol both traveled around England to work on a backstory for Miracle Max and <laughs> Valerie, which like why would you need a backstory for Miracle Max? But because they put in those little details and they were allowed to, you know, go off script for a few of their lines here and there to add those bits in. I think a good chunk of his <laughs> it script feels, was ad-libbed. <laughs> it feels like it does, or at least, you know, self-written. Yeah. But because they were able to do that, well, now Miracle Max wasn't just a weird, creepy man in a hut. Miracle Max was like the Yiddish doctor that I always wanted, <laughs> but also <laughs> don't want. Uh, yeah. No, I I love this film. It's yes. It even going back, not having the nostalgia goggles. I, I I completely understand why children love it, why adults love it. Um, I mean, it there's just so much to it. Like it, even though it is dated, it still holds the test of time. And that it really does. That's a sign of a fantastic movie. It, what, yes. Whether it's whether it was a box office success or failure. It's as long as people love it. And I think that's why this movie is going to endure. Definitely. Like, Well, and the other thing that's kind of stand outy about this movie, as far as a movie that has made it this far, is a lot of movies that have either been cult classic or like a beloved movie always seem to have that one element that someone can brag, like even if the whole movie is not an award winning mm -hmm. movie or the entire cast didn't win hundreds of awards for it, there's usually like one element like, oh, well, have you heard the music for this movie? Or mm -hmm. that one song is this movie? Or, oh, well, the director won an award. On top of it being that this movie, I mean, it did well. Nobody, I don't think anyone won anything for it. I think it might have gotten nominated musically for something. But other than no. that, like, this movie stands by itself without needing the recognition. And, and I think that's part of the reason why it continues to endure. And even the way it ends, I think, is enduring as well. I love the way this movie ends. I, It's fantastic because it repeats the beginning where the grandfather's leaving. And he's like, I, I wouldn't mind if you come back. He's like, as you wish. Well, and they had to retake that as you wish because when they filmed it the first time, mm -hmm. they were okay with it. And then they decided, no, we, it needs to be slightly different. So that As You Wish is filmed quite a bit after the most of the yeah. filming's done, which once you see that, like, you can kind of see it, but it doesn't bother you. But the way that the the book story, like, and by book story, I mean the book that the granddad's reading, mm -hmm. the inner story of the story, the way that one ends, I really appreciate too, because it gives a multiple argument i guess on how the characters do so like mm -hmm. to a kid they ride off in the sunset and everything's grand and dandy and the grandpa leaves and it was a good movie the end and an adult would stop and go but one of them is bleeding one of them miracle max i think says the pill only lasts like an hour or something like that so mm -hmm. is he gonna die <laughs> or no it's it's good for an hour it's that's why they have to get it to him he's like Maybe I was wrong. Maybe they only have 45 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, like, but what does that mean? Like, does that mean that Wesley's going to just keel over at mm -hmm. any moment and go back to being mostly dead? And like, there's a lot of parts for an adult to sit there and be like, wait, no, this movie's not done. But and and that, that's the thing that uh, I think endures is that we're, we're left with such a clean slate. We are. And I think it was the director who said it, and it might be a line from the book, 
life isn't fair, it's just fairer than death. That is all. Yeah. And, I mean, that that's the good thing, is we don't have to know the ending. We We have enough of the world. We can speculate all we want, but all we care about is what happened in that moment in time. And also... It leaves an element of fun. If you have a movie that does neatly wrap up every loose thread, yeah, that's nice, and it leaves a lot of critics without something to complain about, but it doesn't leave your fans anything to talk about for the next 30 years. Yes, and and that's the thing. Speak, uh, speaking of the ending, the movie was supposed to end differently. They were originally going to have them one ride off into the sunset, and then as the f- grandfather leaves, the grandson picks up the book and starts flipping through it, and then as he looks through his window... The, the main cast is riding their horses. My favorite story behind it comes <laughs> from this scene. And this is why I bring it up. So apparently, um, it was either a very specific wine or a very specific brandy came out that day <laughs> of shooting. And, uh, of course, Andre the Giant bought a bunch of it. And, and so yep. by the time they get <laughs> filming, because Andre the Giant weighed about half of a horse, so he couldn't actually physically be on the horse, so no. they were going to hoist him with wires. <laughs> Andre the Giant was 12 bottles in, <laughs> and as their, uh, as his line was supposed to be, hey, buddy, and the director remembers that they had this 500-pound giant <laughs> on wires drunkenly looking down at everyone, just saying, hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, it's so great. <sighs> and that's the thing is, like, I feel like when kids go to action, if they, if they ever do, because I know a lot of people when they watch a movie, they watch the movie for the movie. They don't go into no, depth like yeah. we do and do all that. But I, I think even, even if someone starts to just dip their toe in there, it's a rabbit hole that them, they'll want to know more about the movie. They'll want to know more about how it came about. They'll, they'll want the book. I, I mean, yes. I haven't read the book and I kind of want to get to the book at some okay. point. Well, and this is one of the few movies where you you don't a you don't have to know all of the background stuff to appreciate the movie like like some of the movies we've watched this year, um, like Triplets of Belle Belle. Yeah, you can watch it. You can probably have a good time, but boy, it's so much better if you know all the extra stuff. Mm-hmm. This movie, you don't need to know any of the extra stuff to enjoy it completely. No. Uh, but then once you do start down the rabbit hole, you don't just example being. Uh, Star Wars. Once you start down the Star Wars rabbit hole, you are in forever Star Wars world. My life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in this one, once you start down the rabbit hole, well, now you're in wrestling world for s- because of Andre. <laughs> now you're over here. Hi, Charlie. That was very loud. <laughs> you can go away now. <laughs> okay, kitty. Are you hungry? Is it dinner time? <laughs> <laughs> but it and so you end up in these multiple worlds of each actor who brought something completely different to this movie and in they did it in a completely themselves sort of way so you're not just ended up researching this movie and like how it was made and the special effects like you can but you pretty quickly end up in a completely different side wikipedia article about mm-hmm. About so and so's grandmother and how they have inspired this character and why this castle was picked and you know who so and so was or why Andre couldn't be in the last scene. <laughs> oh, what a dream to be spent suspended by wires and drunk. Uh, well, I mean, if this tells you how enduring it is, the writer loved it so much that uh, he commissioned a tapestry detailing the key scenes. Which, like, that's pretty special. Yeah, I mean, a man who doesn't like his work of the two things he loves. Yeah. This is so endearing. Because, like, even the name, the Princess Bride, comes from his daughters. Because he asked them, what did he, he wanted to write a story for them. What do you want, what do you want me to write? One said a prince, a story about a princess. One said about a bride. And so that's how it became a, the Princess Bride. Yeah. And on top of that... This movie manages to make itself enduring and timeless by also, as we talked about at the beginning, not having a ton of extra stuff to go with it. No. Like, yeah, I've got some magnets and i got some mugs. Are any of them licensed products? I do not think so. (laughs) I don't think a single one is. Most of the time when I'm looking for, you know, 
merch about this movie. It's the movie itself. They just come out with a new version of it mm-hmm. or a special edition of it or, you know, the, the Criterion one that looks like a book. Yeah. Which was so cool. I mean, talk, I mean talking about cool. branding, like... But also, at the same time, it wasn't like Jaws, where there's t-shirts and fanny packs and posters and cars. And... All sorts... Anything and everything had yeah. Jaws on it. And Princess Bride, you just kind of have to accept that you might love this thing a lot, but there's just not a ton of licensed merch for you to own. And that's kind of okay. So, speaking of the legacy of this film, what do you give this? What do you give the rating for this, Chris? Uh, so clearly, this movie is my favorite movie of all time. Without nostalgia goggles on, just looking at it from a critical point of view, from both how it was made, from the effects that were used, from the you know the casting and the script itself. This movie's still probably going to be my favorite movie. Mm-hmm. So, uh, hmm. I think a better question, how likely would you recommend this to the next generation? Oh, they will be watching it from birth. Okay. <laughs> I think that sums that up. <laughs> Your great-grandchildren will be watching it. In fact, I believe we have children coming to visit us who are the fr- children of a friend of ours we haven't seen in a while this weekend. I might put this movie in. Good. Good. <laughs> just just to see, you know, make sure they've seen it, check it off the box. There's a list of movies nowadays, actually, because my husband used to teach, and there's a list of movies that I'm slowly working on of films that I'm kind of saddened that children haven't seen, and a lot of those were things like Mary Poppins or the original Dr. Doolittle, not the one with... Eddie Murphy or whoever. The the original one with the giant pink snail that you haven't seen yet. Oh, it's gold. Or like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. This movie is on that list of like, oh, what do you mean you haven't seen it? We're putting it in immediately. I'm one of those children who you're disappointed who haven't seen it. I know. You are the you are what is wrong with this country, Nico. Yeah. You haven't seen it. I watch so much other stuff though. I would say Chitty Chitty Bang Bang would be up your alley is I don't understand what's going on in that movie either, and I've seen it a lot. <laughs> uh, someday. Someday. Like you said, December's Next. your month. You'll... No, no. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is an Erica night. When okay. Erica decides that she needs a night, we'll put Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, for me, um, I mean, I, I've, I've told you I love this movie, even though it's only been in my life a few years. Um, my thoughts on it is that as long as there are children who dream of grand adventures and adults who wish to ignite the spirit of youth, uh, the Princess Bride, it will always remain a classic. I I find it inconceivable it'll fall to the sands of time. Uh, <laughs> <aw>. <laughs> no, I I that I mean that that's how much I love this movie too. Like I yeah. mean, it's not a part of my youth, but it's going to be a part of my nieces and my nephew's lives. Like, Definitely. We'll make sure Hobbs has seen it multiple times. I'm sure she has. <laughs> I'm, I don't know. Hobbs doesn't watch. Ho- Charlie watches TV. Charlie watches TV. Charlie watches TV. Good. Yeah. <laughs> None of my pets watch TV. It's so disappointing. Uh, anywho, this has been The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. Thanks for listening. Peace.